All right. <clears throat> so welcome to uh, BUSI 17F, uh, basically Advanced Financial Modeling and Equity Analysis. Uh, my name is Professor Perfetti. I will be with you for the next seven weeks. Um, hopefully everybody had a chance to kind of look at uh, the syllabus on ELMS and uh, the assignments. Basically tonight, what we're going to do is a little bit of an intro to the course. And in the files folder of ELMS, uh, there's a full subfolder called lecture notes. And we're going to go through lecture one, which summarizes the, the reading for the first and, and the second weeks of the class. And to basically get you to be enabled at the end of this class to be able to do uh, the assignments, two assignments that are due next week. Um, <clears throat> But as we're getting that started, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. And just kind of go over the syllabus for the semester, just at a very high level. Otherwise you guys can read through this. But uh, again, Professor Perfetti, uh, I have an office that since this is an online course, I won't be in this summer. Uh, that's my email, that's my cell phone. Uh, I'm actually teaching the online MBA tomorrow, so I will actually have my office hours before that class once a week, as opposed to before this one. Uh, if you need to arrange a different time, please let me know. Um, <clears throat> basically, what we're going to do this semester is focus on modeling companies and doing equity analysis. Uh, there's really four parts to the class. Uh, the first one, which we're going to start today, involves the external environment. Uh, preview, approximately 50% of the performance of any business is its market or external environment. So we're going to look at how to analyze that using something called the EIC framework. Uh, finance is about looking forward, not looking backwards. That's accounting. So we are going to, though, in the second section of the class, look backwards to analyze companies so that we can help forecast companies. Uh, not that past performance doesn't guarantee future results, but nonetheless, it gives us a baseline. Uh, the third section of the class will be modeling and, and forecasting companies. Uh, and so we'll be building enterprise DCF models of companies. And then the last section of the class will get into uh, essentially multiples, uh, price earnings multiples, enterprise value multiples, which are linked to our DCF valuations. And, and I'll show you how they're created and analyzed. And so those are really the, the four major themes we're gonna be doing over the next seven weeks. Uh, we will meet once a week for about three and a half hours. <clears throat> uh, every lecture will be recorded and made available online uh, in two places. One, uh, it'll be in the Zoom recording folder. And two, um, I actually have a YouTube channel, YouTube slash Joe Perfetti. And I post all the video lectures there as well, just because sometimes they're easier to access on YouTube than uh, on the Zoom site, or I hate Panopto, if you guys ever had heard of that with other classes, it's awful. So I don't use that. <clears throat> but in any event, uh, so the, the videos will be posted uh, either later tonight or by tomorrow morning. Um, basically, you know, there's an assignment a week, uh, at least one. So I'm expecting at least, you know, four to six hours of work, completing the assignments, doing the readings, uh, getting ready for class. And there's going to be a big group project at the end of the semester, which we'll come back to and talk to in just a minute. Um, the textbook is the seventh edition of Valuation by McKinsey. Uh, we don't use any of the previous editions. They were completely rewritten in the seventh edition versus previous editions. So any old editions don't help you. Um, and, and basically it's 800 page book. We're not doing all of the book. I, I selected specific chapters, but I'll also tell you that if you work in, as a practitioner in finance, uh, in valuation, that book's on your desktop. Uh, you've read it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of other materials, I'll put them on canvas for readings. Uh, again, a good chunk of your grade, 40% of your grade this semester will be a group project. Um, so I made an announcement to, to basically self-form groups. Uh, I think we have 48 people registered. So I'm saying teams of five to seven, minimum of five, maximum of seven. Uh, so you can either start forming groups yourselves, which I saw some people started to do, or if you don't, uh, after today, I'll put you in a group before next week. Uh, so everybody will be in a group. So you don't have to worry about picking a group if you're not assigned to a group, I'll sign you to one, okay? Uh, a lot of what we're gonna be doing is current events. 
And I'll, I'll also give you a highlight that I know that there are assignments starting in week three through week six already posted, but don't get too far ahead because I will likely be editing those assignments as we go along because I want to have the most current data when we do the assignments. Uh, as a matter of fact, for week two, for the NVIDIA data that you're going to be working on, I reposted everything as of this morning. Uh, so you have the freshest data uh, to be working on for the assignments. Um, in terms of grading, basically there are going to be homework assignments in weeks two through six. Uh, and then the points are, you can see under the, uh, under the assignments, how they're spread out. Uh, there will be a final exam, uh, which you'll need to take. It'll be basically multiple choice uh, final exam. And then the other 40% will be a group project. So in the final day of class, uh, each team will make a 20 minute presentation covering the four parts of the class that I outlined on a company that your team will select. Okay, so starting next week, I'm gonna ask each of you, each of your teams uh, to select eight different real world companies. So you can't choose the same companies. And I would suggest they're gonna be publicly traded, but I go to bigger companies. So you could do a Nike, you could do a Starbucks, you could do a Costco, uh, et cetera. And essentially you'll pick your company and essentially each week of the class is a part of that group project. So you'll be doing individual assignments uh, throughout the semester. And then at the end of the semester, you'll kind of do all four of the, the parts of the class for that project uh, that you'll make a PowerPoint presentation of 20 minutes summarizing the four areas in your analysis as the final day of class. That'll be 40% of your grade. Uh, it will be a group grade subject to peer review. Okay, which basically means that I'm going to ask each of you to also submit a peer review, which says, did everybody participate in the team project? Because if you didn't participate in a group project, then you shouldn't get the group grade. But otherwise, everybody gets the group grade. Okay? And that will be 40% of your grade. Right? Uh, homework assignments are, are online. Uh, for course assistance, basically, you can't use external sites like Course Hero, et cetera. Uh, to do work in the class based on people uploading previous assignments from previous semesters. Um, I, I don't really think you're going to be able to use ChatGPT to do these assignments, but regardless, I want you to do your own work uh, this semester. I don't want the AI tool doing it for you. Uh, and so in terms of assignments, uh, there's going to be deadlines for assignments and unless you get to me with a pre-authorization for an extension before the assignment deadline, then my policy is pretty simple. I don't accept late assignments. So you just get a zero, right? So if you think you're working, you're traveling, you're whatever, you're sick, you know, you got a sick baby, whatever it is, if you're going to have trouble with an assignment deadline, send me an email before the deadline and just tell me what kind of reasonable expense you want. Generally, I'm going to grant it. Right. But if you tell me after the deadline that you didn't turn it in and gave me blah, blah, blah reason, and unless you were like in a hospital, death in the family, something like that, then I'm going to say, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to get like, accept the assignment. So uh, if you have any other further special needs, uh, let me know as well. And again, I'll try and be accommodating. But my general rule is I'm flexible before deadlines. I'm far less flexible after deadlines. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other part of the group project. Uh, that's going to happen is we're going to have what we're going to call an investment committee role. So the idea is that for each of the eight teams, you'll present your group project and then one other team will also help me grade you. <laughs> so essentially we're going to call that the investment committee. So when you're making your presentation on the final day of class, you're doing it to me and one other team that is on this call and they will give you a grade for part of that, and I will give you a grade, and the two grades will be your grade, okay? So uh, essentially, uh, as part of the investment committee, uh, you will be responsible for running a Q&A session for the team that is presenting, and then you'll summarize how you think they did in a one-page assessment due the day after the presentations. And talked about peer reviews, which again, are primarily going to apply to the group project at the end of the semester. 
Um, and then the way that the 40% of the grade will be broken out, 70% uh, will be the presentation analysis, 10% will be basically, you know, were you coherent? Could you communicate well in your presentation? Um, and then the other 10% will be the investment committee, right? And then teamwork, are you working together to do the project? I don't want one person doing the whole project, okay? So <clears throat> as we're going through this, uh, I'd like to have some conversations. Uh, I don't want it to just be a complete lecture. No questions and dumb questions. So there's some stuff on here that talks about, you know, participation, which I think is good. Uh, academic integrity is important. Uh, don't do anything that violates the honor code. And then, as I said, the assignments are listed in the assignments, but they're summarized here on terms of what we're going to be doing over the next seven weeks. It's a lot packed into a summer session. Again, you probably had time to look through this. I'll, I'll just pause and see any questions about the syllabus or anything. Yeah, Wade. Yeah, uh, look. Oh, you did actually post the exam date on there. No, I guess uh, I didn't see it when uh, when I was checking. So I was gonna ask that. So yeah, final exam will basically be the last due by the last day of class, and you'll take it online through Elms. Gotcha. So August. 20th for us uh whatever uh, I, I think I'm, I'm extending it to the 22nd okay which is the uh end of the term so it's, it. it's basically you're, you're gonna have flexibility on when you take it that last week of class so you'll you can take it by that thursday but i think i'll hand it out the last day of class or make it available electronically thank you great question other questions uh you is it you Did I have that right You leave. If you're talking, you're on mute. You might need to unmute your microphone. Oh, sorry, I was muted earlier. The okay. uh, question is: uh, Will every lecture be exactly three and a half hours? Uh, I'm not going to say we go to ten o'clock every time, but I, I, based on what I've done last semester, uh, I like to talk. So there'll be. A, at least three hours every class, unless something happens. All right. And I need to let you know that something might happen. Um, I screwed up my foot. I had an MRI today, seeing a surgeon on Thursday. There's a chance that the, I might have surgery on my foot. If I do, then it could interfere with something. And then a class might be a recording uh, as opposed to a live session. Hopefully that won't happen, but I'll keep you posted. Are there other questions so far? All right. <clears throat> so uh, let's go ahead and get started today with lecture note one and the content. So again, a lot of what we're going to be doing this semester is based on the work of the consultancy McKinsey. Um, they have summarized their work on valuation in two books. Uh, one of them is your textbook, Valuation. It's on its seventh edition. Um, it, it's, like I said, very good. And what McKinsey's done is they've organized all of the sort of academic content in a very practical way in terms of what's being useful in the real world. And they have a second version called value because CEOs didn't understand any of the math. So they stripped out all the math and they have a short version of the book, it's about 150 pages with no math. It's called value, right? But you guys are doing the valuation, which is the more the intermediate uh, book. Uh, that is used as a textbook here. It's also used as a textbook at Wharton and a couple of other schools. <laughs> uh, one of the themes of the book, and this is the theme of the course, is what's called the four cornerstones of value creation. These are probably the four most, th four most important things that matter when it comes to valuing companies in the real world. And that'll be a basis for our course this semester. So let's start talking about them now. So the first cornerstone of value creation is for lack of a better word, spread, okay? What we all know as finance majors, I'll put that slide to that but I'll just remind you, 
<clears throat> is a very simple concept. If you could borrow from a bank at 6% and invest that money and make 4%, is that a good idea? Borrow at six, invest and make four. No. Yeah, see, you, you pass finance 101, right? Now, <clears throat> obviously the terminology is a little bit more sophisticated because when I say borrow at 6%, we call that a hurdle rate. We call that a cost of capital. We call that a cost of money or we call it a whack, right? Weighted average cost of capital. Those are fairly interchangeable terms, okay? But the whole idea is that on an annual basis, what rate of return, a risk-adjusted rate of return, do you have to earn to pay back the investors, okay? And when you invest the money, the 4% of my previous example, that's an ROI, right? Average ROI over time is called an IRR, Right? A one-year ROI for a company is called ROIC, return on invested capital. Or in Europe, they call it return on capital employed. Again, in interchangeable terms. Right, But the whole point is that if you can't create a situation where the IRR is greater than R over time, you can't have positive NPV. Well, in the real world, that applies. If you can't earn a return on your investment consistently greater than your hurdle rate, you can't create value as a company because the same thing is you won't have positive NPV, right? So as a basis of valuation, that's foundation, okay? And that's going to be true in how we value companies, even versus how we value industries and projects, okay? Over time, you got to have what's called a positive spread. Return has got to be greater than your risk-adjusted borrowing cost, okay? So <clears throat> given that baseline, two things matter. Number one, growth does not create value. I'm going to say that one again. Growth does not create value. If you borrow at six and you invest and make four and you do more of that, your situation just gets worse. If you borrow at six and you invest and you make 14, well, heck, I want to do that all day long. Growth is the accelerant to value. And what matters is the growth return combination, specifically the growth spread combination, okay? And there's good growth, growth with a positive spread, ROIC greater than WAC, that's value creating. Growth at a negative spread, that's value destruction, right? And that's something that we're going to have to understand when we evaluate companies over time. Growth for growth's sake does not create value. Second point, <clears throat> approximately 50% of that spread, the difference between your ROIC and your cost of capital, is your industry. Your industry slash market is more important to investors than the company itself, says Warren Buffett. Okay, Warren Buffett, very successful investor at Berkshire Hathaway, is in his 90s for 50 years substantially outperformed the market investing in companies. Paraphrasing Mr. Buffett, I never invested in companies. I always started with the industry because if I fell in love with a company in a bad business, there's nothing they can do. Even an average company in a great industry can make money. So therefore, his philosophy, pick the industry that is attractive and preferably enduring. Then pick who's going to win in that order, okay? And in a way, that's the basis for the EIC framework that we're gonna start talking about because we need to understand that external market and that external environment, right? And there's lots of academic studies that say approximately 50% plus or minus of the performance is that external environment, okay? And rather than cite to you those studies all day long, I want to show it to you in the real world. So, <clears throat> this is software called Bloomberg, Bloomberg Professional. Anybody here use it? Anybody a Bloomberg user? Okay. Uh, if you work on Wall Street, this is the software on your desk. Okay. They have 340,000 users. 
uh, costs right now about $27,000 per user per year on a subscription basis. That's for the base model. And then the prices go up from there. Uh, but it's the pro tool, right? It's a trading platform, it's a news platform, information platform, messaging platform. Uh, it, it is, as I said, it's where the financial community lives. There's 1.6 million companies of real-time information in this system worldwide. So you're publicly traded anywhere, you're in here. So let's start with that. Somebody give me a publicly traded company anywhere in the world. Shout out, or you can put it in the chat. Apple. Great. All right, so I'll type in Apple. And one of the nice features of Bloomberg is it allows you to do real-time benchmarking. So this would be the default pure set for Apple, right? Big global tech companies. Now, if you're lazy, which most people in the finance world are, you can start with this pure set. But if you want, you can customize this list to your heart's content, but at least you're starting with a baseline. So here's Apple and its publicly traded peers. It's got all this kind of predetermined templates for data that you can check out. But one of the nice features of the tools, I go to custom and I look up any data point that I want. So the data point I'm gonna look at is called ROIC, Return on Invested Capital. And the tool's gonna to say, which one do you want? And I'm gonna say latest filing. So that's gonna be either through March or June, depending on reporting of 2024, annualized for the last 12 months, rolling four quarters. And what's nice is the top row in white is the industry average. It's the, as of the latest filing, it's the average of all the companies in this list adjusted for size so a, so a tiny company doesn't distort it, right? And then I'm gonna add a column called the WAC, which is the weighted average cost of capital of the companies on this list today. And again, top row in white is the industry average, okay? So the way to read this is that if investors gave these companies money, their WAC is about 11.24% right now, and over the last 12 months, they averaged a 47.37% ROI. Is that good? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's about as good as it gets. This is an amazing industry. Average company has an ROIC of about 10 to 12%. So this is value creation, ROIC greater than WAC. And this is an amazingly successful industry. Okay. Now, Apple's the first row down. How's Apple doing? Pretty good. They're doing even better than average. They're making 57% at scale, borrowing at 10. That's a huge spread, right? By the way, are there other companies in this list doing well? Most of them. Arista. Good. HP looks pretty good. Even Motorola is doing okay. Dell's doing okay. 18%. And that's the point. A negative means you're losing money, right? So there's a company called Credo Technology, right? They suck, right? But they're the outlier. And that's the point. Like every industry could have outliers. But I have a dog. His name is Romeo. He's a chihuahua, nine month old chihuahua puppy. Romeo could pick a company in this industry and probably do well because the industry is so good. And that's the point, right? Industry matters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this as a template. So I don't have to recreate this. Oops, I-718. And let's look at a different company, a different industry. So, so give me somebody else. Another company, another industry. How about uh, Abercrombie and Fitch? Are they still public? Uh, uh, um, it looks yeah, like they're they're pumping. Right. Yeah, they're pumping. Yeah, yeah. All they're right. going crazy. All right, so let's see what it says for Abercrombie and Fitch, and their default peer list. Again, top row in white is going to be the industry average of Abercrombie and all of its peers. And Abercrombie will be the first company down. So casual retail companies. Is this an attractive industry? Yes. 
All right, Ahmad, I see you shaking your head. You don't think it's an attractive industry? Not something I would go into, but I guess if we're talking about retail, it could possibly be. I'm talking about financially. Is, uh, is this financially an attractive industry? Yeah. Yes. It's quantitatively, the companies are borrowing at 8.84, and on average as a group, they're making almost 20. That is a value-creating industry. And by the way, that is an important question for your grades. <laughs> so... Yes. When, when I say, is something an attractive industry, then if it has a positive spread, it's positive NPV, which means it's creating value. If it has a negative spread, it's negative NPV, it's destroying value. And oh, by the way, that's one other very important highlight in this class. This is a finance class, which means in your answers, you will use numbers. If you write vague statements without numbers, I will give you zeros. Okay. This isn't the skim along strategy or marketing class where you don't have to know anything. You can just write shit and they'll give you A's. That's not this class. This is math based, which means it's numbers based. So you will use numbers when you answer the, the question. So if I say, is this a value creating industry? And you say, yes, don't expect me to give you credit, right? You got to say yes, because the industry ROIC is 19.61 and the cost of capital is 8.84. And that's what makes it an attractive industry, just as a hint for grading. All right, Spencer? Yeah, uh, just curious on how much Winmark is actually contributing. I see it's like a weighted average and they're like 1.2 billion, but well, they obviously, have an 180% return, so... Yeah, obviously the, the point of a, a company like Winmark, which is why I'm using a market cap weighted average, is I don't want this tiny company to distort the entire industry because if you did a straight average, you're going to get a wacky result, right? And so that's the whole idea of why we use weighted average here. Uh, Thomas? Yes, could we look at the airline industry just out of curiosity? I, I'm, I was about to ask for another one. So yeah, we absolutely could. Give me an airline. Uh, Southwest. Okay. So we'll start with the discount side of the airline industry. <clears throat> I need like the, the Jeopardy theme music to play while we're while we're waiting on something. Some something to make it dramatic. All right. So Thomas, since you had wanted to see this, you tell me. What do you think about the airline industry? I guess it does not look like an attractive value creating industry. Why? Um, because the return on invested capital is lower than the weighted average cost of capital. And its return invested capital is? Uh, the 7.7% versus? 7.72. Yeah. I mean, you, you could probably call it MBV zero or break even, but this is not nearly like the ones we just looked at. Is there anybody on this list outperforming? Delta, Copa. Yeah. But a lot of the companies are not, and that's the point. This is a much more difficult industry, right? It, it's not like the one we just looked at for Apple where almost everybody was doing well. Here, it's a much more difficult industry. That's the point. Industry matters. Markets matter, okay? How's Southwest doing? Really badly right now, okay? In fact, that's why there is a hedge fund I think that's our vulture hedge fund that's actually pushing their way onto the board to try and get them to change their business practices, right? Because they're frustrated about their underperformance, which is not what you heard from Southwest historically. But regardless, that's the point. Industry matters. Markets matter. Different industries, different structures, different rates of return. I also want to introduce a second definition, competitive advantage, okay? In the real world, everybody thinks they're good at something. So you go talk to a company that's performing poorly. They're like, oh, we have competitive advantage. In this class, we use a relative definition for competitive advantage. If you're really better than your peers, you should outperform your peers. Therefore, in this class, a spread above the industry average spread is competitive advantage. With that definition, does Southwest have competitive advantage? No, they do not. Does United have competitive advantage? 
for a 108. Yes. Yes. Does Air Canada demonstrate competitive advantage? Yes. More than one company can demonstrate competitive advantage. Okay. But that's the idea. You have to be above average. That's competitive advantage. Right? If you're not above average relative to your peers, you, you're not really better. Okay. And that's the whole idea. Like you can make money because you're in a great place. Right. But if you could be in a great place and outperform, well, that's different. And that's how we're going to start thinking about EIC, industry, economy, industry, company. Okay. Make sense? Raymond? Yes. Is there a, a, a number that's used to describe the, the spread? Like, is it um, a ratio or a percentage? You can do it as a ratio, but but typically it's just ROIC minus WAC. So what you should be looking at as a finance major is when you see ROIC, think IRR. And when you see WAC, you should see R. And, and what you're describing to me, just using slightly different words, is positive or negative NPV. So you're basically saying, this industry has a zero NPV. The IRR equals the R. Right? Southwest has a negative NPV because the IRR is less than the R. Okay, that, That's essentially what we're saying here. We're just putting it in the business context. Okay, But what I want you to really see, give me another industry, somebody. COF. COF? Yeah, Capital One Financial. Oh, is a bank? Yeah. I want to stay away from financial services. Uh, and, and, and the reason why is they're a little unique in that when you deal with a bank or financial services company, debt becomes a little wonky. And what I mean by that is that if Southwest has debt, it's pretty clear that debt is financing the planes. If... Capital One has debt. Well, that's kind of like a cost of goods sold. They're going to get an interest margin on their debt. And they have some debt that's kind of financing the balance sheet for long-term capital. So it's not clear whether the debt is operating or whether it's financing. And so typically when we do ROIC, we're separating out operating from financing against cost of capital. So what we do with banks is we actually use ROE against cost of equity. Same concept. Except the reason why we use ROE, not ROIC, is because um, of the debt. We, we can't tell whether debt is really operating or financing. And so what we do is we just ignore the debt and we just look at net income. So therefore, return on equity. So same concept, but that's why banks are a little bit different and we're not going to be dealing with banks this special. Uh, so another industry, another company. Oil oh, industry? Auto? Oil. Oh, Oil. Yeah. So give me an oil company. That's uh, ExxonMobil. Okay. So here is oil and gas. And again, this will be, I think the default list will be global. Yes, yeah, this is global oil and gas right now. So Industry, attractive, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, borrowing at eight, making 14. Uh, Exxon? Yeah, it's also attractive. Borrowing at 7.9. So they're creating value. Check. Does Exxon demonstrate competitive advantage? No. No, because that's an example of good, good industry. Like Exxon right now is in a good place because oil's you know, at scales is what, 80, 90 a barrel, All right? So they're making money, but the problem is they're not outperforming. Okay, so they don't demonstrate competitive advantage using our financial definition. Okay, by the way, they, I'll show you traditional auto. This does not include Tesla. So ignore the electric vehicles and just look at traditional auto. Ford, Toyota, Kia, uh, BMW, Daimler, <clears throat> Volvo. How does the automobile industry look right now? Uh, not me. Not at all. It's a terrible industry. Okay. By the way, I can rank them. You know who's doing really well in the automobile industry? 
Ferrari. So there's outliers, but they're pretty much the only outlier. Maybe Subaru, maybe Volvo, but once you get to that, every other company, negative spread. Because these companies are spending billions and billions of dollars to build the electric vehicles of the future that you haven't bought yet. And they're still dealing with supply chain disruptions coming out of COVID. And so the automobile industry is a tough business. By the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Ferrari's profits, over half their profits now, come from apparel. They make more money as a lifestyle brand than they do selling their quarter of a million dollar supercars. And that's intentional. Okay? But regardless, this is a tough industry. And the point I want you to understand with the exclamation point is that why I'm showing you this, industries matter. Some industries are more attractive than others. If you're in this auto industry, it's going to be hard to make Apple-like returns. If you're in the tech industry, it's much easier to make those returns. Markets matter. Questions? Let me show you one more. You guys heard of a company called NVIDIA? This is your homework assignment. How do you think semiconductors look? Great. That's the last 12 months. Since it's your homework assignment, I won't say too much about the data, other than if you look at row 112, there's a company called Marvell Technology. And I have to say, hats off Marvell. Like they're the only company losing money in a golden age of semiconductors. How do they do that? Like, what is so unique about Marvell that they're screwing it up so bad? All right, that's the first cornerstone. Any other questions? Let me just quickly check the chat. Somebody's talking about Walgreens. Oh, I can do Walgreens. And here, where he did oil. So, Wal was it Walgreens, Boots, WBA? So this will be probably a short list because it'll probably be Walgreens, CVS, and Rite Aid, if I had to guess. Uh, Food and drug stores, there we go. I wonder where CVS is on the list. I'll go this way. Put CVS here. Because I know Walgreens is on CVS's list. But you can see those numbers for Walgreens. It's no surprise that they are closing a lot of stores. Right? And, and that's the thing. CVS and Walgreens are in... I'll go to this food and drug store part of CVS competitors. It's just a really, really tough business. Because basically... They sold a model on convenience. The, the statistics in the United States are, I think, something like 90% of the population is in within 15 minutes of a Walgreens or a CVS, right? And, and so they're very convenient. But the problem is that if you ever walk into one of these stores, they have 20,000 products in that store. And there are many grocery stores, many Walmarts. And they don't get enough volume for the amount of stuff that's in the store. And their ROICs are terrible. And their margins are relatively low. And historically, they made it up on, on pharmacy. But the, the stores themselves are, are really struggling. And then the same thing, e-commerce is taking over. And people are not seeing the convenience of the Walgreens when they can order online and it'll be here in four hours by Amazon. So unfortunately, it's, it's become a very, very challenging business. You can kind of see it here. Terrible industry. All right. 
That's the first cornerstone. Second cornerstone, I'm going to stay in Bloomberg, is it's about cash, not income. Okay, Income is a piece of paper. It's like a pay stub. It tells you how much cash you will eventually generate, but we care about something called time value of money. So therefore, when we get the cash, changes its value. So valuation is based on cash, not income, right? Income will tell you what the cash will eventually be, but timing matters. So valuation, cash flow. Third cornerstone. Everything I've shown you for the last 20 minutes is a magic trick. I have tricked you like a good magician. Because when I'm showing you this data for CVS Walgreens or NVIDIA, or Apple, or ExxonMobil, what are we looking at? The past. Exactly. We're looking at last year. Valuation, third cornerstone, is about the future. It's called the expectation cornerstone. You are worth the sum of your future cash flows, not your historical cash flows. So what you did in 2023, who cares? All right? I care about 2025. That is much more important, right? So the future cash flows lead to the valuation, not the historical cash flows. And we got to be careful when we look backwards. Matter of fact, that's the difference between finance and accounting. Accountants look backwards. They're all about scorekeeping. What happened last quarter? What happened last year? What happened last month? They keep score, right? But finance is about the future. What happens next month, next quarter? next year. That's more important to value than what happened last year. So that's the whole point. When we deal with the future, we deal with risk because the future is unwritten. So I estimate what the cash flows are going to be. Near the, that's the whole point. I estimate, I guess. Now, eventually, I'll know what those cash flows are and I will adjust. But ironically, I never get to the future. Okay. So here's the whole point. What data suggests, started at Chicago in the 70s, go back 100 years, is that whatever cash companies, assets of any type earned, became their price in the real world. Whatever cash was generated became their price, okay? That's intrinsic value, right? You're worth the sum of your future cash flows, right? So if I know what the cash flows are, as Warren Buffett says, in the short term, I guess, in the short term, I guess what the cash flows are going to be. Stock prices are voting machines. But in the long term, it's a weighing machine because when the cash flow comes out, then it'll adjust to the actual cash value. That's your price. But in the real world, the problem is we never get to the future. Okay, Think about it. The next 10 years for any company are probably the most important cash flows just because of time value money. Okay, So let's say we predict CVS Health's next 10 years cash flows. Right, which we're going to be doing later this semester, right? That's going to be a big part of their DCF valuation. Okay, so today, what are the ten years going to be? Now, over the ten years, I'll see what they actually are. But here's the rub: it doesn't matter anymore. Even if I went into a time machine ten years from today, the last ten years don't matter. It's the next ten years because you're always worth the sum of your future cash flows. So, the important thing for you to understand: price is always expectation. That's actually what's hard to beat the market because it's not based on what you do. It's about what you're expected to do. Okay. That expectation equals price. And when you deal with the future, you got to deal with risk because you're not always going to be right. Cornerstone number four. Jump out of Bloomberg here. Cornerstone number four is competitive advantage. <clears throat> it's no longer enough to have, okay? <clears throat> the original kind of driver of competitive advantage, a guy named Michael Porter, Harvard University, wrote a book in 1984 called Competitive Advantage. And he said, you got to have two. Either you're a cost leader, which means you're going to sell it because you do it at lower cost than anybody else. You're going to win that way. Or you're going to be differentiated some unique way that sets you apart from somebody else. Those are the two sources of competitive advantage. And that evolved in what's called the moat theory. Warren Buffett's a big espouser of the moat theory. Got to have a moat around your castle. 
okay? What's your motive, okay? Could be a brand, could be a cost advantage, could be a quality advantage, could be a regulation, could be a patent, but you gotta have a moat. That moat is your advantage, protects you against competition and allows you to earn outsized returns. So moat, 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 gotta have a moat. Good market, good moat. Problem in today's world is what happens if the competitors don't care about your castle anymore. Your moat doesn't matter. What happens when you're Nokia who, who dominated the phone business and the world moved to mobile touch computing starting with the iPhone? Didn't matter how good Nokia's patents were. Didn't matter how good their business model was. The world moved on to something different. So the moat, okay, great moat. Nobody wanted to invade that castle. So competitive advantage today, the guru, her name is Rita McGrath. She's at Columbia University. She's replacing Michael Porter as the person for competitive advantage. And she's written two seminal books. The first one about a decade ago is called The End of Competitive Advantage. And her whole point is that competitive advantage is transient. Whatever your advantage is, it's going to go away. So the question is not, do you have an advantage? The question is for how long? And do you have a what's next? That's basically how we're starting to think about advantage today. It's time-based. It's transient. It's called the wave theory. It's like a wave. It's going to crash. And like any good surfer, you're looking for the next wave. So you're going to be doing both, which leads to book number two, about three years ago, called Seeing Around Corners. Okay? You got to see around that corner to put your business into the next feature market. Because if you don't, when the world moves and you don't, then you're screwed. And that's what we see with disruption. So many companies were the company at the time, the world moved, and they were the company of the past. And they didn't move to the future. And then their business went away. Okay? And there's just company after company after company that's been in that problem. And so that's the whole idea of that fourth cornerstone. We got to understand whether or not markets or industries are attractive, but not only are they attractive, for how long? And do you have a competitive advantage for how long and what's next? So those are the four cornerstones. And those thematically are the major things we're going to be talking about this semester. So I've been yapping way too long. Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, crippling fears about any of this so far? Well, kind of question that's, um, it might be, I guess, a, a little bit off topic, but what's kind of, um, if you're Bloomberg right now, is there, obviously it's, you know, been the go-to source of every Wall Street analyst and everyone who basically works on Wall Street. But if you're Bloomberg, is there some fear in the room of, you know, someone coming up with a, you know, AI solution to basically make it more simple or if, you know, someone were able to sit down and develop a program that could replace it? Yes. Okay. And, and that should be the, that's actually the right question. So the question is not about the dominance of this software. The question is how long is this dominance going to last? Because mm -hmm. there's going to be a what's next. And it's just what kind of pathway or runway do they have? Now, some companies will have a longer one than others, but it doesn't matter who you are. It's going to go away. I'll give you a new stat. How long is a company going to stay on the S&P 500? Like, what's the estimate? Like if you're on the S&P 500 today, how long are you likely to stay on that list before you're removed? Isn't it like only a couple of years? It's like not as long as you think it is. More than a couple of years, but it's 12 years. Yeah. We lose half of the S&P 500 in the next 12 years. Think about that. These are some of the biggest com companies in all industries. And, and because of the rate of change, it's going to switch. Who would have put Nokia, or, or sorry, who would have put NVIDIA as the most valuable company in the world a decade ago? Sleepy gaming company. Nobody would have seen that, okay? And that's the whole point. Like, list the top 10. If you go back and you look at the 10 most valuable companies by decade, it's staggering how different they are. 100 years ago, they were oil and gas. They were railroad companies. Uh, Railroad companies aren't in the top anymore. 
right? Matter of fact, nine of the top 10 companies today, tech, right? That's transformed the world, you know? And, and so that's the whole point. And even the tech companies are different tech companies. 20 years ago is Wintel, right? Now Intel is on death's door. They're really struggling, right? Because they don't have the right chips for AI. Nobody wants their chips anymore. Their PCs have gotten so commoditized and they don't have an alternative in this future. And they're really, really struggling, right? Yet they were so dominant 20 years ago. Nobody would have challenged Intel, but now the market has moved, right? What happened to Dell in the year 2000? What happened to Cisco? Cisco's worth a trillion dollars. They're the first trillion dollar company. Now they're worth 100 billion. They've lost 90% of their value since the year 2000, right? Because the value of switches and routers, they become commoditized. So what I'm telling you is you just see historically that the world is churning and you got to churn with it. And if you don't churn with it, you're not going to be relevant. Now, some industries churn faster than others, but that's our role in finance. We're going to model stuff. All right, it's not just modeling the cash flows. That's the easy part. The math in this class doesn't go beyond algebra. We're not doing calculus here. We're not doing differential equations. This is not the hard part. It's the art of the valuation. It's what assumptions do we put in? Why do we make them? That's what's key to valuing a company. Okay, and I'll give you an example. It's going back to Bloomberg. It's easy to see. <clears throat> By the way, Bloomberg does have competitors. Uh, Cap IQ is one, it's $5,000, a lot cheaper than the 27,000 sub subscriber. And Thomson Reuters has something for a thousand, okay? But Bloomberg right now benefits from something called the network effect, right? See, the problem with replicating Facebook is these other social networks, it, they're hard to start up because you got to bring all your friends with them. And so if you go to a social network and your friends don't go, then that social network's not going to be successful. And that's why it's very rare for a TikTok or something else to kind of jump out of here because we're established in our social networks. Bloomberg is the social network for the financial community. It's a system of record. If I send an IM on Bloomberg, then that one, I know that it's going to be to a financial person. And number two, that's a, that's a record. That's an official record of a trade or a transaction. And so that actually embeds them in their high price for what they do. Okay. But nonetheless, they're still going to be challenged and they're trying to keep up and they're trying to evolve. Everybody should be. All right. But let me show you something about the future. So back to the cornerstones. Two years ago, the best selling drug in the world, non COVID, was something called Humira. It's an anti inflammatory drug, very important to a lot of people. And the company that sold it is called Abbey. And <clears throat> this is a financial forecast by Wall Street for Abbey going into the future, not only the company, but by drug. Okay. So, in a lot of data on the screen, but what I want to show you is that. AbbVie in 2022, which would be this column right here, had $58 billion of total revenue and 21 billion of that was just Humira's sales globally, All right? That was 21 billion of sales at 90% plus gross margin. Very profitable, okay? In 2023, Humira sales fell to 14 billion. This year, they're expected to fall to 9.6 billion. By 2027, under 5 billion. Why? Why are the sales for Humera going down so dramatically? Patent. A generic at least. Yeah, the patent expired. And this is what happens in the pharmaceutical industry when the patent expires. So generics are here, biosimilars are here, competition's here. When you're the only game in town, 21 billion, at 90% margin. Now they're gonna be 5 billion at a 30% margin. Well, that's a different value for a company. But I'm just telling you, do you think Wall Street, if you're covering this company, do you think you're talking about the $21 billion glory days of Humera in 2022? Like nobody cares about that, but the accountants, right? What I'm telling you is the entire question I have is, what are you gonna to do to replace Humera? 
by the way, they have a drug called Skyrizi, which I don't know what it does, but I know there's lots of commercials for it. I can't turn on a TV show without seeing a Skyrizi commercial. But the whole point is that was five billion back in 2022. That's expected to grow to 17. So this is their blockbuster that's replacing it. But what's interesting is Humira is essentially being replaced by Skyrizi, but they're kind of canceling each other out in terms of the sales. So again, when we look at valuing a company, what happens over here is far more important than what happened in the past, right? Future matters. Right? Matter of fact, if you tried to explain why NVIDIA has become a trillion dollar company, if you looked at their historical data, you start questioning the math. He's like, well, they're probably a little overvalued. So let me show you some data. So in 2022, here it is, NVIDIA, or sorry, 2023, had $27 billion worth of total revenue. Okay. In 2024, 61 billion. That's actual. This year, 120 billion. By 2027, 191 billion in sales. In 2023, their profit on $27 billion worth of revenue was 9 billion. That's pre-tax EBIT. In 2027 on 191 billion of revenue, EBIT, 122 billion. That's profit. So when you think about a multiple, okay, three trillion divided by 122 is a multiple of about 30. I'm not saying that's not a high multiple for a company, but I'm telling you it's not crazy because that's the point. People are valuing NVIDIA, not based on what they did, but what they're expected to do. And if they keep hitting these numbers, then the cash flows justify a $3 trillion valuation. This is where the action is. It's in the future. That's the third cornerstone. Now, there's no guarantees to these futures, but it's really important to understand what these futures are when we value companies. That's the other reason why Bloomberg is so valuable, because it's one of the few tools in the world that gives you access to what Wall Street believes is the future of these companies, right? And there's a baseline. Now, nobody agrees with the baseline, right? But nonetheless, it is important to understand this baseline because if you look backwards, you will not be able to come up with a reasonable justification for the valuation of NVIDIA. And by the way, where is all the sales and profit coming from? It's not the gaming business. This is gaming revenue. Last year, gaming revenue was 10 billion. By 2027, 13 billion. Now for a normal company, that's actually not bad growth. But for NVIDIA, it's the data centers. Last year, 47 billion, up from 15 two years ago. By 2027, $170 billion just to data centers. That is Google, that is Microsoft, that is Amazon. Those are their customers. That's 60% of their revenue. Those three companies are buying all their chips. That's where they're making all their money. And that's what's important to understand about NVIDIA. It's the growth of the data center. Why are data center sales exploding? And by the way, you're going to be talking to me about this in your homework assignment. So I'm giving you a little preview. Why is data center growth exploding so much? Gen AI. Why is AI relevant to data centers? Uh, data centers have like the high workload. Because the processing power required to do these large language models, chat GPT, you can't do them on a phone. You just can't. They're just not powerful enough. So that's why basically AI is primarily processed in the cloud. And in order to do that processing, you know, a lot of data center power, which means you can need the data centers, you need the cloud. And that's why these companies are exploding. They're making huge investments in the cloud. And NVIDIA, it turns out, their gaming chips, Blackwell's, their most recent one, are the best suited for AI processing. And, and so they have a competitive advantage 
around the best commercially available chip in a market that's hot. And I'm not going any further because this is what you're going to be talking about in your EIC assignment. So again, thoughts about this? Make sense? Does anybody know where these numbers I'm showing you come from? These like investor analysis for the future. Yeah, and then the past actually, state. Yeah, who, which investors are we talking about? Um, Or not investors, analysts rather, that work for these big banks. Yeah, so I'll, I'll simplify. There's something on Wall Street called the buy side and sell side. Does anybody here work for the buy or sell side? What's it called? Your day jobs? <laughs> All right, so... Basically, for NVIDIA, the buy side are the shareholders. They're the people that are literally buying and owning a company stock. In Bloomberg, it's called holders. Bloomberg tracks institutional ownership. This is a scrollable list of all of NVIDIA's institutional shareholders. 73.19% of their shareholders are in this scrollable list. Today, NVIDIA's largest shareholder is Vanguard. Vanguard owns 2.1 billion shares of NVIDIA, which represents 8.67% of the company. BlackRock is their second largest shareholder. They own 7% of the company. FMR's Fidelity is their third largest shareholder. They own about 5% of the company. So if you think about this, call that 9, 16, 21% of NVIDIA is owned by these three institutions. This is called the buy side because they're buying and they're owning, okay, for both dividends and stock appreciation. And so there are analysts that analyze companies and say, who should I own that will get me a good return on my investment? Okay, that's what they do. Okay, and so <clears throat> again, and by the way, this is their founder who owns three and a half percent of the company which when you're worth $3 trillion, he's doing okay. <laughs> but uh, long story short, um, what I was gonna say about this is that let's say you work at BlackRock and you're in an actively managed fund and you don't have to be a very big fund. You could have like $5 billion under management, right? But one of the things you're gonna do is you're gonna diversify because you're as good as NVIDIA has been, you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket. So you're gonna buy different companies in different industries to diversify your fund, okay? So the problem is, how do I keep track of 50 companies in a diversified portfolio that I'm managing at BlackRock and all their competitors and all their markets and all the different industries on a daily basis? And the answer is I can't. <laughs> like too much going on, right? So what I do is I hire another group of people to help me out. And this other group of people is actually more important to the stock price of companies and they don't actually own the stocks. So these are the consigliere to the buy side, called the sell side, okay? And Wall Street spends $4 billion a year for the buy side, paying the sell side for research to tell them what to do. So I'm gonna go hire somebody to tell me what should I do with my NVIDIA stock, okay? And the sell side are these people. These are called the sell side analysts. When a company has an earnings call, these are the people that are unmuted and asking the questions. And it's you can tell who they are. So for NVIDIA, it's Stacy Rasgott of Bernstein. It's VJ Rakesh of Mizuho, Aaron Rakers of Wells Fargo, Atif Malik of Citi, uh, who's on here. All the big banks are on here. It's Goldman, Barclays, JP Morgan, Needham. Okay. So that's the point. These are the people that write the buy, sell, hold opinions. And the buy, sell, hold research reports are actually not for you and me. They are for the institution because basically these firms sell their research to the institution. So I, BlackRock, hire Stacy at Bernstein to tell me what to do with NVIDIA. And as of July 8th, she says, buy more outperforms buy, 
Okay. And so therefore I'll actually add more NVIDIA to my portfolio. Okay. So <clears throat> right now, thinking about the long term of a lot of people are covering NVIDIA, 65 of these analysts call NVIDIA long term buy. Buy is worth five points. Seven of them call NVIDIA hold, holds over three points. One says sell, it's overpriced, uh, sells are worth one point. On a five point scale, NVIDIA is looked at as a 4.73 out of five long term. That's what the sell side research is telling investors today. They also create a target share price. Where do I think NVIDIA share price is going to be 12 months from today? Okay, wide range. Uh, KeyBank this morning said $180 a share. Bernstein yesterday said $130 a share. Uh, Wolf Research said $150. So there's a wide range of share prices. What they do is they put their guesses into Bloomberg. Bloomberg averages the guesses. Okay, wisdom of the crowd. The average share price guess for NVIDIA 12 months for today, 136.68. It closed today at 131.38. What Wall Street is saying, sell siders, is that there's 4% upside in NVIDIA in the next 12 months. Last 12 months through this morning, it was up 209%. So amazing run, but it's not going much higher. So own the stock at your peril at this point, because there's likely more downside risk than upside risk to NVIDIA. I'm not saying Wall Street's right or wrong, but that's what they're saying about NVIDIA today. Questions? By the way, I'll take Bernstein as an example. This is the coverage universe Stacy's team has at Bernstein. They just focus on these 10 semiconductors. A Wall Street firm, which is doing the sell side research, the analysts there, it's a team of three, typically. It'll be Stacy, it'll be an MBA in finance, and an undergrad in finance. And one of those people might have like an also like a management tech background. So they're also an engineer. So I'll have somebody who understands technology from a new semiconductors, but it's a small team and, and their entire life is writing research on these 10 companies. Okay. And, and selling their research for profit. Now, if you want to see their research, here is all of Bernstein's research on NVIDIA. Do you notice my screen in Bloomberg is blank? Do you know why it's blank and it's not an error? You got to pay for the research. <laughs> That's not included in the $27,000 subscription price. You want access to Bernstein's research? You got to pay Bernstein for access to the research. Okay. So we actually at Maryland have a few that we have access to banks. One is JP Morgan. We get JP Morgan, we get Barclays, we get Deutsche Bank, uh, but we don't get Goldman, for example. We don't get Citi. Uh, but nonetheless, so there's the research of her team, if it was there. And this is Stacy. So Stacy, her little bio. Oh, I thought it was a her. It's a him. That's Stacy. I thought it was a, it's a guy. So Stacy works in LA, 1999 Avenue of the Stars. That's his phone number. That's his email at Bernstein. That yellow dot means he's logged into Bloomberg, but away from his terminal. And I can IM him. And I will tell you that if I actually, I am Stacy, he'll respond because he's getting it through Bloomberg. And then when he realized that I'm just some yokel professor in a class, he'll block me, right? But first time you'll get to these people because it's 340,000 people in the finance community all talking to each other on this social network. And they will talk to each other all day long on IM. And again, messages are considered actual records. This is mini bio. So before Bernstein, he worked at McKinsey, uh, Sanford Bernstein, he's at MIT, which would make sense. There's the technology side as the analyst. And then he's got a bachelor in chemistry and a doctorate in chemistry. So he's more on the, the tech side than the finance side. So the people under him are probably more the math people. But sorry, Marcos? Yes, what does market perform and underperform mean? You know, under recommendations, they're telling them to... So. It's marketing. <clears throat> so so rather than just say buy, sell, hold, they get a little fancy with their warning. So market perform is another way of saying hold. 
basically you're just going to do an average. You're going to be average. You're going to be no different than the average S&P company, right? Underperform means same thing. You're going to underperform the market. That's called a sell. And outperform is another word for buy. This is just marketing. So what Bloomberg tries to do is standardize all their language as to uh, red, green, yellow. So reds are sells, yellows are holds, greens are buys. Yeah, Jonathan? Yeah, can you see um, like each analyst's past predictions like summarized so to see how accurate they've been? Absolutely. Everything they do is tracked. Every guess. <clears throat> And we can see how good they are at guessing. Which is also why you start to notice in the real world, there's kind of this crowd effect. There's a pack mentality. Because if the pack is wrong, then I don't look bad. But if the pack is right, and as an outlier, I look, I'm look i wrong, then I look really bad. So they tend to move together in packs. And so what, what matters is what's called the lead steers. Because some of these analysts are pretty much morons, right? Because you don't have to know a lot to do this job. Now, you're not going to be staying in it forever. But basically what you do is you just plagiarize. Like you find out who's good. So if I, you find out, oh, the guy at Bernstein's really good. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read his research and then rewrite it. I'm going to look at his models for companies. I'm going to summarize based on his models. And so they'll suss that out. <clears throat> in fact, I was doing some work a few years ago for a company. And uh, Fidelity, which is their largest shareholder, was talking to their senior leaders. And I was there for a lunch talk. And one of the conversations was at the end, I said, you know, who Fidelity do you think is good that covers this company? And he named it. And I said, who do you not think is good of these analysts? And he said, for his industry, it was Wells Fargo. And it's not the firm, it's the person. He said, nobody respects this guy. He said, but we'll still throw some business his way and give him pay for some of his research because he will get us tickets to Tory Pines anytime we want. So basically, we'll give some money for his research just so we can play Tory Pines, right? But we don't respect anything he says because we know that he just copies the other analysts. So I'm just saying, like, there's the way the world really works. But nonetheless, you're getting a little bit of an inside view, inside baseball view of some of this stuff. Yes. Another hand, Raymond. Uh, yes, why aren't the analysts or researchers called the sell side when they could recommend buys or holds? Because they're selling their research. That's okay. Because because I'm literally selling it to the buy side, but the buy side is more important. Matter of fact, when a company has an earnings call, and here on Bloomberg, EVT, are the actual earnings calls. And so the morning of the earnings call, which their next earnings call will be on... August 23rd, this is right here. It will populate the call-in number and the code to unmute right here in Bloomberg. So if you're brave enough, you could actually go into Bloomberg, get the pin to be unmuted the morning of the call, and then get on the call. Now, the company will probably quickly kick you off, but this is where the analysts actually can see an event calendar. And one of the nice features is every time there's an earnings call, so for example, here is their latest earnings call, Bloomberg also does a real-time transcript as the call is happening. And then they'll edit it for a final transcript by a person after the machine learning is happening. But the idea is this is the transcript of the call, of the last earnings call, which is searchable. And I can actually search all of their earnings calls uh, for any information about it. So this is like, I'm showing you less than 1% of what Bloomberg does which is why it's such a very valuable software uh, for companies. But regardless, here's the last thing they do. What these people do, these sell siders, is they also, because I'm going to value NVIDIA, is I have to create a forecast for NVIDIA. So this is the whole point. This is the Excel model forecast for NVIDIA. And when they forecast NVIDIA, Uh, oh, so it will forecast. What screen did I get to? Go back. Oh, I got there. So they forecast NVIDIA in Excel. And when they forecast a company, I guess what I'm showing you here is they don't just forecast 
top line, they got to forecast all their cash flows and markets. So they'd have the different segments, the different margins by segment, uh, the different revenue in each of the segments, geographic breakdown, how many GPU revenues, Tegra processors they're selling, balance sheet data, lots of stuff being forecast in Excel because that leads to the cash flows. And so what they do, you can kind of see it here, is if I look at NVIDIA, these models are actually uploaded to Bloomberg. Over here. But you'll notice there's a little lock by them. So you can actually download any Excel model from any bank, but you got to pay for it. But when the nice feature though, is because they all upload their models to Bloomberg. What Bloomberg does do is it aggregates and averages all of the guesses by all of the uploaded spreadsheets, okay? That is called the consensus. So when you hear about a company missing or meeting their consensus earnings, what it represents is the average of all of the guesses of the sell siders that have forecasted the company. So this screen summarizes the average of all the guesses. So that was the point. That's what I showed you earlier in a different version of the screen. But last year's revenue, this is the actual column, 61 billion. This year, 120 billion. Because 67 people uploaded guesses for what revenue would be for 2025 NVIDIA. Eight were excluded as mathematical outliers. The average guess was 120 billion. The highest guess was 132. The lowest guess was 112. And that created the consensus. That's exactly how it's created. So when a company reports its earnings, it's going to report against what people expect. So for example, on a quarterly call, this is what's expected for their next quarter and at the end of July. So when the earnings come out, so here's what they did in April. This is what Wall Street expected. And this is what NVIDIA reported for the April quarter. So when the earnings came out, the consensus estimate was 24.7 billion in sales. They reported 26. Consensus EPS, 56 cents, they reported 61. Consensus EBIT was 16 and a half, they reported 18. Consensus free cash flow was 12 billion, they reported 15 billion. So if you wonder why the stock price popped when they reported earnings, it's because they blew away the consensus on everything. They just, just outperformed. So again, that's another part of the, the game that Wall Street plays. Noah? Um, so is missing the cons consensus based on revenue or what? what is that based off of which measurement, net income? It could be anything. So you, you could miss, like NVIDIA is a company that's exceeding everything. Let's look at somebody like a Boeing. Okay, so here's the last quarter for Boeing. Revenue, 16.3, they hit 16.5. Uh, they were expected to lose 477 million, they lost 86 million. Uh, so they ended up losing a lot less than expected. I'm trying to see if I can find a company, Was it Raytheon? So here's Raytheon. They hit, they actually exceeded their revenue target in the last quarter, 19 billion versus consensus 18, but their operating profit was lower. Their margin was lower. Their EBITDA was higher. And their free cash flow was a little bit less, mainly because they spent less CapEx than we expected them to. So that's where the questions will start to come. Why did you spend $70 million less of CapEx this quarter than we thought you were going to, right? Is it because you're seeing some softening of demand and you're cutting back on your spending? Was there problems getting things ramped up? Like, so that's where the questions will start to come off of the call uh, because then what they're going to do is they're going to then reforecast the future, right? Because that's the whole point. The whole point of an earnings call is these analysts have their models open and they're just kind of adjusting their forecast for the companies based on what they hear in the call.
and then they go talk to their buy siders and then they start trading based on that information. Anyways, again, more detailed than we need to know for the class, but giving you a sense of how this kind of plays out. Raymond? Uh, what's the relationship between the consensus and the guidance that's provided by companies and which do they try to um, meet? Well, the short version is guidance is just that, which means I'm going to give a, a range of what I, so here's Raytheon's RTX's guidance. I'll give a range of what I think it's going to be. So for example, their guidance for 2024 is about 78 and a half billion. And right now the analysts, all the average guesses are 78.95 billion. So Wall Street thinks that they're actually sandbagging a little. That's that's real time, okay? And so when they report, they're going to be judged not on the guidance. They're going to be judged on what the analysts think. In fact, that's the role of investor relations. The role of investor relations for a publicly traded company is to make sure that the analysts don't get too far from what's actually reality because we don't like surprises in either direction. And if we get big surprises, then we will penalize the company. So even with the analysts, if they get too optimistic, companies have to start talking them down. You can't give them a number, right? Because if you give them a number and you're wrong, you'll get sued by some lawyer, right? But nonetheless, it, it's a game that, that has to be played, but you're gonna be judged based on how you do against the consensus. That's what's most important. All right, so our next topic is gonna to be called key value drivers. That's the math behind the cornerstones. But before we go to the math, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So it is 7.48, let's start back. I'm gonna pause the recording and we're gonna start back at 8 p.m. So I'll see everybody back here at 8 p.m. All right, let's go ahead and uh, start back from our break. I did see a question in the chat about whether or not you have access to Bloomberg. Uh, the answer is Maryland has 60 terminals scattered on several campuses. Uh, the biggest one is there's a teaching lab in Van Munching Hall 3505. That's where I do my undergrads because I get 180 undergrads a semester. There's 32 terminals in that room. Uh, but basically, as somebody put in the chat, they do have a couple terminals. Uh, in Baltimore and DC. And I think they might have one in Shady Grove. Uh, but you physically have to be in front of one. It's free when you're a Maryland uh, student to, to use it, but you can't access it remote. You have to physically be in front of it to use it. Uh, they don't want the software on the web uh, or access to it. So no sharing uh, through like Zoom or stuff like that. But uh, one of the things I just want to quickly show you uh, what these cell side models look like this is an actual sell side model for Verizon from UBS uh, from April of this year. And in case you're curious what they do, like they model out Verizon's income statement in detail. Uh, they do it by quarter and they do it annually. Uh, then they model out parts of their business. So this is Verizon's wireless business, subs, mixed subscribers, uh, postpaid, blah, blah, blah. This is their consumer business. This is their business to business business. This is the forecast, their balance sheet. These are all the cash flows that come out of that. Here's all their financing costs in terms of interest that's paid. Uh, this is a summary of the guidance the company had given the analyst. This is all those cash flows turned into a DCF. <clears throat> and comes to a share price follow PE, EV to EBITDA, price to cash flow, et cetera, down here. And it is based on that that they write their buy, sell, hold, and pay. And this can come along with it if you have access to this. So this is what they're selling. Uh, now, you are going to be doing a more simplified version of this this semester, okay, in terms of modeling out the companies and, and doing it. Uh, but nonetheless, <clears throat> It's, it's a very similar process. They're just getting into a little bit more detail uh, for real companies. All right, so before we go forward, questions about anything? Uh, 
how much are we going to have to utilize the Bloomberg terminal for our assignments? Well, <clears throat> the bad news, good news is I'll start with the good news. You're not going to need to use it because I'm going to export the data and put it in Elms because I know you don't have access to the terminals. I wish you had access to the terminals, but that would involve you physically coming to campus. And this is an online course. So unfortunately, we're, we're kind of bridging it. So I'll be putting the data from Bloomberg for you to use. That was NVIDIA this morning. So I took the most recent data from NVIDIA this morning and I updated it and uploaded it for your homework next week. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> so back to our PowerPoint. The math is called the key value drivers behind the cornerstones. Oh, sorry, Tyler, you had a question? Sorry, your hand. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I just had a last minute question. This is about the exam. Um, since it wasn't uh, posted within the syllabus, uh, yeah. do you know if the exam is going to be like within a certain time window or is it unlimited time within? The I believe I give you a four hour window to take it when you start it. Okay. So it, it is timed. So you don't have like unlimited time to go back and forth, but it's not like mm -hmm. you get to do it in an hour. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Key value drivers is the math. KVD shortcut. Okay. And so I'm summarizing all the math on this one PowerPoint slide, but at a high level, we've already been talking about it. the first thing that matters to value creation is ROIC versus WAC. That's spread. Okay. Because those percentages are a proxy for cash flow. Right, 10% ROIC means you're generating 10 cents of cash per dollar of investment. 20% ROIC means you're generating 20 cents of cash per dollar of investment. Okay, growth, how fast you grow that spread, and sustainability, that's competitive advantage. ROIC is a function of two things. Your profit margin, how much you make when you sell something, and your productivity, how much you have to invest, like balance sheet investment, to generate sales. So five things come out of the math. And these are the five most important things to value creation. Your margin, your productivity, how much you spend to sell something, your risk, your cost of capital, your growth, and your competitive advantage and, and your ability to maintain it. Like that's what matters, okay? And so the math leads to the cornerstones, but we're gonna deal with the math this semester. So <clears throat> let's get technical. And this again, was in the book, but I'm just summarizing it here. So I want to define a few things. So one of the things we're going to define is something called no pat or no plat. McKinsey calls it no plat. The rest of the world calls it no pat. No pat is net operating profit after tax. No plat is net operating profit less adjusted taxes. It's basically your EBIT after tax. So the idea is how much profit do you make regardless of how your business is financed? So we're kind of looking at the operations of the business. We're going to pay taxes on that because we're not not-for-profits. So let's say we start out with a generic company that makes $100 million a year of no pet. $50 million is reinvested. $50 million is paid to investors. That creates two additional ratios. The percentage of the profits reinvested is called the reinvestment rate the percentage of the profits paid out is called the payout rate. Those two percentages have to add up to 100% of your profits. So basically when you make money, you can do one of two things with it. You either reinvest it or you pay it out, right? So one minus the reinvestment rate is the payout rate. One minus the payout rate is the reinvestment rate. Those two ratios add to 100%. In this simplified example, 50-50. 100 million of profit, 50 million reinvested, 50%, 50 million paid out, 50%. Okay. On the next slide, I'm going to define two more things. G, which is your sustainable growth rate, or the rate at which you can grow with internal funds, <clears throat> and something called free cash flow. Okay. Starting out with G. So let's take this company, which made 100 million and reinvested 50, and let's say, to keep it easy, it makes a 10% ROI. It made 10% historically ROI, and it's gonna make a 10% ROI in the future, okay? So if I put 50 million in at 10%, I'm gonna get 5 million of new profits, 50 times 10%. 
<clears throat> if my core business keeps making 10%, I'll still make 100. So over here in the bottom right, I started year one with 100 million. I make 10%. So I keep the 100 million in year two. I get 5 million on my new investment. My profits next year go to go to 105. That's a 5% growth rate. Okay. Here's the shortcut. G, growth and profits, is the reinvestment rate times the return of the new investment. I reinvested 50%. I make a 10% ROI, 10% of 50%. That's 5% growth. Okay, so growth is ROI, it's expected ROI, incremental ROI, <clears throat> times <clears throat> reinvestment rate. But that leads to a question. Let's say that I want to grow G 10% a year instead of 5% a year. How do they do it? In this math, what would have to change to make this G 10%? You do a 100% uh, reinvestment rate? 100% reinvestment, which means slash the dividend, no dividends, no payout. Reinvest 100% at 10%, you make 10% growth. Now, a lot of CEOs of publicly traded companies are not going to like that trade-off, right? People can tend to get used to the dividend. So let's say you don't want to slash the dividend. You want to maintain your reinvestment. How could you get to 10% growth? You have to up your return. To 20%. Yeah. 20% ROI, 50% reinvestment gets you 10% growth. The important reason I wanted to illustrate that is that ROIC is related to ability to grow. <clears throat> you ever wondered why companies like Apple or Google or Facebook Meta have so much cash? Because they have extraordinarily high ROIs. And so therefore they make enough money that they don't need external funds to go fund their investments. Ironically, companies that have low return need very high levels of reinvestment to grow. And remember, where's my Capital One person here? The rule in banking <clears throat> is to lend money to people who don't need it. And the second you really need the money, we don't want to lend it to you anymore. And so that's the point. The companies that have poor returns that want to grow it gets harder to attract the capital to grow because they got to put a lot of capital in at low returns in order to grow. Whereas the higher returning companies <clears throat> can grow much even more easily. Everybody wants to lend them money. And to be honest with you, they don't need it. <laughs> so they can actually get the borrowing at pretty reasonable terms. And so ROI actually reflects ability to grow. That's something I want you to understand. The other thing I want you to understand is that you are not worth the sum of your future profits. That's a misnomer. Because you're going to have to reinvest some of those future profits. Buy a car, any car, brand new, off a dealer's lot. Keep the car for 10 years. Don't do any maintenance on the car. I'm telling you, the car is not going to last 10 years. Right? So just like a car, a company is the same thing. I can't take all my profits and pay them out because I got to take some of my profits to maintain my business or it's going to start falling apart. And if I want to grow my business, I got to put some of the money in to grow. So basically, I'm not worth some of the profits because I got to reinvest it. What I'm worth is the profit after the reinvestment. That is what I can pay out. There's no accounting term for that. So the finance people created our own term for that. We call that free cash flow. Okay, free cash flow is the theoretical payout rate, right? And it's free, not because it doesn't cost anything. It's free because it's free and clear. It's the profit after the reinvestment. It's what's left to pay out. So companies are worth the sum of their future free cash flows, not their future profits, right? And that's key to how we're going to value companies. Make sense? Calculating free cash flow is hard. I'm going to make you do this as part of homework too. You're going to hate it because it's hard. It's, it's it, The accounts don't do it for you. And you have to rearrange the, the financial statements to actually get to a free cash flow. But it's critical if you're going to do valuation. All right. What is free cash flow? It's the cash from the income statement called gross cash flow minus the cash reinvested in the balance sheet, gross investment. 
So income statement minus change in balance sheet is cash flow. Okay. And that is going to be part of your homework assignment next week to learn how to rearrange financial statements to estimate free cash flow correctly. All right. Now it sucks, takes time, got to be done. This is where McKinsey came in. Calculating free cash flow is hard just because you got to rearrange statements that accountants don't give it to you in that format. Calculating ROIC is much easier. ROIC equals free cash flow. So McKinsey's approach to valuation is a free cash flow valuation approach. But what they say is because ROIC is the proxy, it's easier to estimate and forecast ROIC than to estimate and forecast free cash flow. And they're going to be the same answer. So that's McKinsey's approach. It, it's the ROIC approach, which is a free cash flow based approach, but it's a little bit more practical when you actually do this in the real world, <clears throat> just as an FYI. All right. So summarizing everything I told you, looking at this slide, there's two companies, company A, we just started with hypothetical company A, and I'm going to add a hypothetical company B, a competitor. And these two companies have identical profits, hundred million growing at 5% a year. So 100, 105, 110, dot, dot, dot. So you have two companies that are peers that have identical profits and identical growth rates long-term. And they have this, both have the same cost of capital, 10%. Would these two companies have the same value or would one company be worth more and why? Based on the data on this slide, are they worth the same if they have the same profits and same growth? Or is one company more valuable? Spencer? I'm going to take a guess that company B is more valuable just because it's larger. Or it, it's, if like What's it's larger? free cash flow, it's free cash flow is larger. Yes. So over time, because we're not doing linear growth, it's exponential growth. So exponentially, it's going to grow faster than. So, so basically what you're saying is B has more free cash flow than A, therefore it should be more valuable. That's actually the right answer. So is it Marcos? You had a question? Thought? No, I was, I, was gonna, I was gonna answer the question. Did you say B as well? I was gonna say B as well. Yeah, so what you should have looked at, anybody in this call, is you should have looked at the free cash flow and it should include you in that B generates more free cash flow and therefore it'd be more valuable, right? But what I want everybody in this call to understand is why, right? The reason B generates more free cash flow than A is because B's investment, can you see my mouse as I move it around? Okay. B's investment is lower to generate the same profits. The reason B doesn't have to invest as much, assuming they're not cutting corners, is because the ROI at company B is 20%. And the ROI at company A is 10%. Because they have a better return, they're better at what they do. <clears throat> they don't have to invest as much in order to make the same profits. Or let's say B invested 50, the same as A. Well, at a 20% return, 50 will grow to 110. 50 at a 10% return will grow to 1.5. And at 110 minus 50, the free cash flow will still be higher than A. So if you have a higher ROIC, you will generate more free cash flow because one of two things will happen. You'll either at the same investment make more money or make the same amount of money for less investment. That's what a high ROI will equal to. So therefore, ROI is a proxy for free cash flow. More ROI, more cash flow, more value. And then here's the caveat at the same level of growth. Okay. What makes it tricky in the real world is that the growth rates are different. Okay. Right? So here's my point. And I'll show this to you in Excel. So I'll start with this blank workbook. Here it is. Share. 
All right. So let's say we have two companies. <clears throat> One company makes 10%, which is 10 cents. The other company makes 20%, which is 20 cents per dollar. Okay. And if I ask you which is more valuable, 20 cents is worth more than 10. Right. But now let's put growth into play. The company making 20 cents grows 2% a year. So equals 20 cents times 1.02. <clears throat> the company making 10 cents grows at 10% a year. Equals 10% times 1.1. Watch what happens over time. Eventually, starting here in column K, so we're now like, what's that? C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. 11 years out, company A, which was making 10 cents, growing 10% a year, will start to generate more cash than the company making 20 cents, growing 2%. And then it just gets more exponentially valuable. That's the key to valuation. Valuation at its basic form is three things. What's your return? How much cash do you generate? How fast do you grow that? And what's your discount rate? And so if you have the same hurdle rate, then it's just growth and return. But that's all it is. Companies are worth the growth spread combinations. So back to the math. The difference between a company and a project, it's projects end and companies are assumed to last forever, right? Now, none of us are gonna be around to find out if that's true for most companies, but we assume they're gonna be around for a long-term. So to value a long-term cash flow, we use something called a perpetuity, perpetual cash flow. And if that cash flow grows at a constant rate, growing perpetuity. The formula to value companies long-term is at the bottom of the screen is a growing perpetuity. Tell me your cash flow divided by R minus G. Cash flow is free cash flow. R is the WAC. G is the growth in that cash flow. Okay. So that's how we value companies long term. That's what you're taught. Okay. So most people, what they'll do is they'll go five or six years of year by year forecasting. And then they'll use this formula for what's called continuing value or terminal value. And they'll say year six or year seven in a perpetuity is the growing perpetuity. So add them up. What's the value that you're the continuing value period to the year by year period? That's the value of the company. That's the process we're going to do for DCF. It's pretty straightforward. But there's a problem with that formula. Cash flow divided by R minus G. Actually, there's two problems. Problem number one is we're literally simplifying the value of companies to three numbers. So we are oversimplifying every company, whether it's Nike or Pfizer, to these three numbers. That's their share price, okay? Problem number two, this formula assumes the internal rate of return on future cash flows equals the internal rate of return on historical cash flows. Translation, whatever your return on investment is today, you stay that way forever. So the problem with the math that we use to value companies long-term is take a company like NVIDIA, which has a 90% ROIC. That formula will assume NVIDIA will always have a 90% ROIC and it will never come down. And what it means is that we overvalue NVIDIA. Take that formula and apply it to one of those automobile makers that are making three or 4%. They will always make three or 4%. They will never improve, and we will tend to undervalue those companies. So the problem with the math that we're all taught to use is it exaggerates the current situation into perpetuity. And that's a math problem you can't get around with the growing perpetuity equation. It's a limitation you need to be aware of. But that's what they use in the real world, and that's what they teach you in most finance classes and textbooks. So this is McKinsey's attempt at an improvement. 
what McKinsey did, and this is called the key value driver equation, is they rearranged the math. And the formula on the right is a growing perpetuity. But here's what they did. They started with a traditional growing perpetuity, cash flow divided by R minus G. And it said cash flow is free cash flow, which is profit times one minus the reinvestment rate. And if investment rate <clears throat> is growth equals investment rate times ROIC, then reinvestment rate rearranged is growth divided by ROIC. So the formula on the right is just a rearrangement of the formula left using math. But here's the point. The reason why McKinsey's version is better is this ROIC in the McKinsey version that we're going to use is incremental, which means this is the future ROIC, not the historical ROIC. I can actually use that in the formula where I couldn't do it with the original equation. So in the McKinsey version, I can put in an incremental ROIC, which is more representative of the future. Now it's one ROIC for the entire future of the business, but it doesn't have to equal the past. So let's say I'm, in, I'm valuing NVIDIA and I think they're making 90% today, but I think over time they're only gonna make 30%. I could plug 30% into this formula and get a more realistic valuation. I can't do that with the original growth. <laughs> That's what you're going to be using this semester. Now, <clears throat> when <clears throat> you looked at this slide and I asked you which company was more valuable, which of these two companies did you tell me was more valuable? A or B? B. 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 Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this formula and I'm going to quantify that in Excel. Okay. So here's how we're going to do it. So I'm going to open up Excel. And I'm going to put the data in. And I'm going to use some friendlier terms. So this is the data off that PowerPoint slide. Company A, company B. Both companies started with $100 million of profit after tax. They're no bad. Both companies were expected to have long-term growth rates of 5%. Company A had a 10% ROIC. Company B had a 20% ROIC. Both companies had 10% wax. If I took that formula and plugged in those values, company A would be worth a billion dollars and company B would be worth a billion five. So all I'm doing is quantifying what you told me. You told me B is more valuable. I will tell you based on that information, E will be 50% more valuable. They'll be worth a billion five. A will be worth a billion. Then we have something called the price to earnings multiple. The price to earnings multiple of company A is 10. Their price, a billion, divided by their earnings, 100 million, is a PE of 10. Their price, a billion and a half, divided by the profit of 100 million, PE of 15. So company B would also trade at a higher multiple because multiples are not unrelated to the values. They come from the DCFs. They have to be can't change your valuation methodology and get a different price for a company. It's long one price. Got to get the same answer. And so that's the point. Multiples are just the rearrangement. They're the shortcut. So ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. Multiples are the proxy for cash flow valuation. DCF hard, multiples easy. Similar answers. ROIC easy, free cash flow hard. Similar answers. But nonetheless, we're going to do both this semester. Questions? Make sense? This is called key value drivers. Now, <clears throat> there are 
five scenarios that I need you to understand. And if you understand these five scenarios of this exercise, then you understand 80% of what's going to happen to any company in the real world. When you read a newspaper article, you're, you're going to get the sense of what's going to happen to their share price. Because when the key values drivers change, the values will change. So we're going to go through the scenarios. Okay. So let's do a little what if. What happens if A doubles its profits? So instead of 100 million a year, it starts making 200 million a year. Okay. But before I hit enter, nothing changes about their long term business model. They're still going to grow at 5%. They're still going to make a 10% ROIC, still make a 10% cost of capital, but they doubled their profits. What's going to happen to their value and what's going to happen to their PE? Uh, in theory, they should double. Value should double. What about the PE? Uh, same. Okay, let's see. Here's enter. Here's triple. Here's company B, double, triple, quadruple. Notice as I change the profit, they don't change. That percent, percent, that the value is changing, but the multiple's not. <clears throat> In finance, this is called sizing. I am more valuable because I'm bigger. I just absolutely generate more cash but I'm not better. People aren't paying more for my profits. I just make more profits. It's called size. Okay, it's one way to become more valuable. Just get bigger, generate more cash, absolute cash. But a lot of what's gonna drive value is the better. What's gonna drive the multiple? And so earnings don't affect multiples. I can make a dollar. It won't change my PE, okay? So if the profits don't affect my multiples, what affects my multiples? key value drivers, growth, return, cost capital, growth, spread. Multiples are just an expression of future growth spread. That's all they are, okay? So these growth spread combinations lead to those PEs. So let's say, scenario number one, company A goes into a new market. And they're now a U.S. company, Costco in the U.S. goes to Europe, okay? It's going to go with its low-cost business model, but it's going to grow faster because it's got a brand new market to go sell to. So it's still going to make the same return on investment, but their growth rate's going to be 6% per year versus 5% a year. So profits go from 100, 105, 110 to 100, 106, 112, dot, dot, dot. What happens when I hit enter? to the value of company A, now growing at 6% a year, and the multiple of company A, what happens to its PE? Does it also grow? All right, let's see how much. This is 6% per year. By the way, I'm gonna go back to the 100. 100. This is 7% per year. This is 8% per year. Any change it? No. But is, is it? Hold is, on. Here's six, seven, eight, nine. Why is B changing and A not? Higher return. Partial credit. Emmy? But is it also because the uh, cost of capital and ROIC are equal? For which company? Uh, for a company A. And so if your ROIC and cost of capital are equal, what does that mean? Uh, there's no uh, multiple. Yeah, because you get multiple. zero NPV. Like if you have a 10% ROIC and a 10% cost of capital, it's like a zero NPV. And so when you grow a bunch of zero NPVs, you know what you get? Zero NPV. What's different about company B? Uh, 
have a 10% spread. And when you grow positive spread, you become exponentially more valuable. I like to call company A the treadmill. You run really fast, you don't go anywhere, and eventually you get tired. Okay, that's the problem. A lot of companies are like, oh yeah, I'm growing really fast, but they're growing with no spread because they're investing so much to grow that it's not worth it. The, the returns are kind of equaling their hurdle rates. So the growth is not valuable. Where company B is NVIDIA or Apple. Like if I can grow the high rate of return, that's what's going to drive a lot of value. That's what I'm looking for. That's what investors, that's the golden goose. But those are two scenarios. You got growth at no spread and growth at a high spread. And they will lead to different outcomes when it comes to valuation. Does everybody see that? Scenario number three. What happens when company B matures? You're Coca-Cola and people have decided sugar's bad for them. And so they drink less sugar water and you're the sugar water company. So Coke has been cutting costs. They maintain their margins. Sugar water's cheap, but their growth is slowing. They're having trouble convincing the younger generation to, to get hooked on sugar. So what happens when your growth goes from 9% to 6%, to 3%, to 2%. Did you notice the value in the PE went down? This is the expectation cornerstone at work. I priced you as if. I priced you as if you make 20% and you grew that at 9% a year. I realized I was too optimistic. You're going to make 20%, but you're only going to grow that 20 cents, 2% a year. Well, 20 cents growing at 2% a year is worth a lot less than 20 cents growing at 9% a year. Your values will come down. Your multiples will compress. This happens to every company because two things happen. One, law of large numbers. Growth rates slow because you get bigger. And you mature. When you mature, your growth rates slow down. When you mature and your growth rates slow down, your multiples will compress. Scenario number four. I have a negative spread. I borrow at 10 and I make eight. What happens when I grow? Your return stays the same. The value of the multiple goes down. If I keep destroying two cents of value at a faster rate, I'm worth less. So the more I grow, the worse it gets. This is bad growth. I, I want to avoid this. And that's what I'm telling you. These are the four scenarios. Do I have the treadmill? Do I have kind of like golden goose, high growth, high return? Do I see the slowing growth, high return, cash cows? Or do I see my dogs? Yeah, you know, my terrible businesses, that are growing at poor returns. Those are the value destroyers. Those are the business I want to harvest, exit, sell, shut down, lay off, right size, whatever you want to call it, because throwing money to those will not create value. And every business scenario is going to fall into one of those four scenarios. Questions. It's called key value drivers. How long do you need to observe that uh, negative spread before you decide to make a decision that would end that line of activity, essentially? So here is Bloomberg. Here is um, a company called DoorDash. And here is the current spreads of kind of the online delivery companies. Who are growing very fast. And this is their spread.